how I made $125,000 on launching our video course. In this episode, I talked to Aaron Francis. We dive into what worked and what didn't. One thing that I thought of the night before, it's a distribution hack. That actually scares me. Are there any mistakes that you made? I sent emails too quickly and Gmail put us in the penalty box. I should have warmed up the domain better, but I'm hesitant to send emails because I'm a developer. You have to warm up that reputation. Even though you've grown a pretty substantial audience, the numbers that you're putting up in course sales are significantly higher. I have been able to put together an audience that really trusts me. It's not enough to do the work. You have to tell people as well. The expertise comes from showing your work. This was the hardest lesson that I had to learn in my creator journey, and we share all the details. Aaron, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So let's just dive right in. Okay. And I want to hear about the course launch that you just wrapped up. Yeah, so me and my partner Steve just finished launching our first solo uh, video course. It's about a database called SQLite. I won't bury the lead. It's at 125000 in sales right now, which we're very happy Congratulations. about. Congratulations. Thank you. It's a... Uh, we, we, can, we can get there, but it's a very good launch um, for a moderately niche technology yeah. and I think uh, proof that what we're doing is sustainable. It's not enough to live on for two people, but it is a step in the right direction and we're very happy with it. So what time period are we talking for that launch? Oh, goodness. A couple we months? probably launched a month ago. Okay. Yeah. 125 in 30 days. Not, not bad. Not a bad game. Not bad. And there's something to this whole creator thing. Yeah, it <laughs> might just work out. Um, with a relatively um, small list size, I yeah. think we launched to maybe 4,000, 5,000 on the email list. Okay. Um, and a relatively low price. I mean, we did uh, sticker price right now is 149 Okay. And they got a $20 off coupon for being on the list. So it's like... Pretty small list with yeah. small value, and it's like, you know, still made a lot of money. Yeah, so you're not doing, like, some people are like, oh, this is a cohort-based course, and it's $1,000 mm -hmm. or 3000 and instead you're like, hey, this is yep. tightly packaged value, like, delivering far more, you know, value than what we're charging that is, for. That is the hope. Yeah, so right now, I think right now it's, like, at 70 videos across maybe seven or eight modules, mm -hmm. um, and then I've got two more modules coming so maybe another 10 or 15 videos and after that early access will be closed mm -hmm. so i would have loved to have finished it all but we decided okay we gotta launch let's launch yep. and then we can use those as little like bumps you know in the future yep. send out another email that's like hey there are more videos and hopefully people will buy well that's exciting there's a lot of things when it comes to a course where you want reasons to talk about it more mm -hmm. and you know we could list out and brainstorm all the reasons that you can promote it again but one of the reasons is we just launched a new module mm -hmm. of 10 videos. Yep, exactly. So having that in the back pocket. So I'm, I'm turning my uh, inability to finish it on time into this super positive like strategy. Oh, yeah, I, was, I knew that all along. So basically what you're saying is you've gone fully from developer to marketer. Exactly. I mean, don't, yeah, don't tell my friends, but I am fully a marketer now. Yeah. There's times where conversations come up internally. I'm like, I don't know how we're going to get people on board with this or how that's going to work. And I'm like, we're marketers. Yep. You know, part of our job is to understand what's, not, not we're saying that we're, we'll spin it in some way, but really of saying like, hey, what's the value for, mm -hmm. you know, everyone involved in this? And yep. and that's what marketing is. It's yep. And clearly it's, it's value. working great so far. <laughs> so this might actually be my preferred strategy in the future. Yeah. Launch with like 90% done, call it early access, mm -hmm. which like gets people to come in and say like, ah, I'm part of this thing early right. and then do the last 10%, get some bumps, reasons to send emails and then close early access, which hopefully will be another bump to say like early access is going away. You have two more days to buy it and then it's going up to 199 or right. something. So. so let's talk about that of the different reasons that you can promote a course and yes. how we can bring urgency into it because people do this thing where they follow creators and they say, that's amazing. I'd love to buy that someday mm -hmm. and they just never do yep until you bring in urgency so the ones we've talked about so far are you know ending early access right so a price increase mm -hmm. um, urgency of some kind you know or reason to talk about it around additional modules what other things maybe have you already used in the launch or are you thinking about in the course business as a whole so like every developer turned 
marketer, I'm hesitant to send emails, Mm -hmm. right? Because I don't want to bother people because I don't like being bothered, right? I got to get over it. I know, I know, I know. So um, one of the things that I have done is um, interviews with experts. Mm -hmm. And part of me feels icky about interviewing experts and then putting that behind a paywall because I'm like, hey, um, you know, Kent C. Dodds, lend Mm -hmm. me your time and then I'm going to sell it. (laughs) It's like, I don't know about that. But what I've done is I've done these interviews with experts and then put them on YouTube and on we have a you know our own domain where the course lives and on that course domain and then that that allows a few things one is i get a whole new audience from youtube right right so i get these people who are like oh, i've heard of kent c dodds i don't know who aaron is let me listen to kent cuz i like kent and then it's like mm-hmm. oh they're talking about sequel light uh, let me go check out this course that Aaron is doing. That also allows me to send out an email and I haven't sent them for every expert interview, but I have sent them for mm-hmm. a few. That's like, Hey, this is free, which you know, assuages my guilt, yep. <laughs> my, my unfounded guilt. Uh, this is free. You can go watch it. Like enjoy. Also, by the way, don't forget I exist. Mm-hmm. Like that's the kind of thing that I've done. Um, and then in terms of other, so that's like expert interviews, new modules, price increases in terms of other emails, honestly, not a lot. I haven't sent out a lot more beyond that. And in terms of like, um, you know, we do have a YouTube channel that now has, I think, 43, 42,000 subscribers. Nice. And so what I'm doing there is um, I'm in a really lucky position because the content available to teach is practically infinite when it comes to databases. Okay. And so I can do a very specific, here's an esoteric database thing that makes a really fun, interesting YouTube video. And in that put like a native ad of me saying, I teach more. Like, right. you like this video, you're watching it, I do a lot more of this over there and you can go buy it. And I think that's been pretty helpful. Um, and then to flesh out the different uh, platforms on Twitter, it's very much like behind the scenes. Like, mm-hmm. hey, here's all my sticky notes on my wall of the videos I need to record. Here's behind the scenes of me actually recording it. And so I feel like each platform dictates what the message should be, um, if that makes sense. Have you done behind the scenes content on YouTube? Um, not on YouTube. I haven't oh. done behind the scenes videos. I wonder if because YouTube is so much more of a search algorithm. Mm-hmm. But I, I'd be curious to see how it how it does. Like, yeah. That's something that I would try, of like a behind the scenes, you know, how I made the course. Right. And just see. Yeah. The thing that really strikes me as uh, a good idea to do there is, and this, I just, I got to get over this, but the, the video title, how I made $125,000 on a launch, right? right? It's like, come on, that's, that's an obvious thing you got to do. Um, but I think in time we will have a second channel that is more of the business slash creator side where the primary channel focuses on developer content just on that title i made me think of the most popular title i think that i've maybe ever written and that was how i made twenty seven thousand dollars in the app store while learning to code yep and i remember that (laughs) i've been around i remember that yeah when when number one on hacker news like 30 40 000 visits in two days and you know, it's just one of those things where like the juxtaposition in the title works mm-hmm. super well. It was something that people wanted to wanted to pick mm-hmm. up on. And but yeah, you get into these things where you're like, okay, I know this is gonna work. Mm-hmm. And on one hand, I, I feel like, oh, it works because it's clickbait. Mm-hmm. But when I actually take a step back, I realize it works because this is the content people want to consume. Yes. Right? It sparks the curiosity, it's yep. well packaged, and I just want to consume that. Mm-hmm. And so it's like Give the people what they want. I know, (laughs) I know. And like the thing, the way that I can like justify that is I don't have to promise that everybody can do it. Like I don't have to sell some. You're saying how I did this. How I did it. Here's my story. And if anyone can take inspiration, strategy, or tactics from that, Mm -hmm. awesome. But I'm not going to go on any platform ever and say, hey, it's really easy to make $100,000 as long as you buy my $1,000 course. Like, (laughs) I'm never, ever going to do that, but I don't have a problem necessarily with, here's how I did it, and hopefully this is Mm -hmm. fun, entertaining, inspirational, or something. So we're going to go, we're going to do two things. First, I want to talk through, like, your business lessons learned, all of that. That's this interview. Okay. And then we're going to do a second episode where we'll get up on the whiteboard and uh, just tease for everybody what's the business problem that you want to dive into when we're you know yeah. brainstorming the future of your business 
Um, going from a successful single event, which is a course launch, mm -hmm. and turning it into a sustainable business empire. And I use empire very loosely because it's me and Steve. It's yeah. me and my buddy. And we just want to make, um, frankly, a lot of money, but mm -hmm. we don't want to we don't want to grow into, you know, 30, 50 people. But right now we're at a point where we have proven the model can work. And now we need to figure out how to make it a business and not just a yep. good event. Yeah, that makes sense. So I want to go back to the business side and, mm -hmm. and talk about that more. A lot of people, you know, we led with the $125,000 mm -hmm. launch. What are some of the things that you feel like you really nailed in that launch mm. that made it so that, okay, this worked really well? Yeah, I think we did a good job of um, kind of building up the hype beforehand. Yeah. Um, so my partner, Steve, is uh, a proper video guy. And so he came to Dallas where I live. He lives in Boise, actually. Yeah. So I'm, you know, I get to see him. Um, he came to Dallas where I live and we shot like a like a hype video, which you think hype video database course, <laughs> that doesn't go together. That's what made it so great. It was like the most ridiculous hype video ever for this niche database technology. And so, you know, put that out on Twitter um, and did great. And we got a lot of people signing up for the list. So mm -hmm. got to have the list ready to go. Um, we had a really beautiful, have a really beautiful uh, website slash course platform. Um, and I think in terms of like the actual launch, one thing that I did that I thought of the night before was I live streamed the whole launch process. Okay. So I got on, uh, you know, I stayed up on, I think it was a Wednesday night, stayed up to like 4 a.m. trying to finish everything because I'm, you know, it's very stupid. And Thursday morning, I'm like, all right, we got to flip the switch. And I turned on Restream and went live on YouTube and Twitter. Okay. And was like, okay, we're launching the course. And everybody knew it was coming because I tweeted yeah. about it and they're like, all right, it's coming. You queued up the emails, yes. all that. Yeah, so emails are going out, which is a, a funny story. Emails are going out and I'm like, let's do it live. F it, let's do it live. <laughs> yeah. How many people that you follow are live streaming on Twitter at any given moment? Yeah, it's almost none. It's gotta be one or two. Yeah. Barely any at all. So I go live with a, a title of like, launching high performance SQLite. And so already everyone on on x is seeing that little red banner that's like aaron francis is live it's yep. like pinned in the sidebar yeah, and the visibility that you get huge it's like would you like a fraction of a yes second of attention mm -hmm. for your mm -hmm. 280 characters or would you like to or dominate? do you want position sticky <laughs> yeah so that everyone sees it all the time yeah and by the time it was done you know who knows how they count metrics it's all it's all made up by the time it was done it had like one hundred and twenty thousand views mm -hmm. and how long were you live for? Two or three hours. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's a long and time. It's a long time. And like during that time, I'm literally like, I have the microphone in front of my face. I've got Steve on speakerphone and I'm like, hey man, uh, this thing isn't working. And you can hear him talk on speakerphone back. And like, we're trying to figure it out. I'm sharing my screen. We're like trying to do the launch and I'm writing the launch email on stream. And people are like giving me feedback like, hey, that sounds really dumb. You should change that. And I'm like, oh, that's actually a good point. Um, and so I think that was um, an accidental hack that paid off in a huge, huge way because mm. that brought in a, just a huge amount of attention. Um, yeah. And it was novel, which mm -hmm. I think is pretty important. Um, I had a lot of people commenting that this was the first time they'd ever seen any like launch behind the scenes. Because most people will do that and they're saying, hey, we're going to do a webinar mm -hmm. and, you know, or we're going live and we're going to teach this thing or it's there's a five day window for the launch mm -hmm. and here's what we're doing each day. And you had this totally casual, mm -hmm. like, I'm just going to show you the behind the scenes. Yep. There's nothing polished about this. Not even a little bit. I am so disheveled, hopped up on coffee, Steve's on speakerphone, and we're like debugging. Yeah. W were there any negatives that came from that? Um, I honestly don't think so. I didn't leak any, you know, keys on stream or <laughs> yeah, anything. Yeah. Some of those, um, <laughs> like, whoops, there's the GitHub credentials. Yeah. <laughs> no, honestly, I think it was a, a pure win, which I was yeah. just, and to do it just on a lark and have it be one of our best things we did was like, oh man, that's a good instinct. I'm, I'm happy that I did that. So going live, what was a takeaway that you would apply to another launch? Like, are you going to do that every launch going forward? 100%. Yeah. Yeah, I will. Um, one is 
it's a distribution hack because like we mm -hmm. talked about, um, Twitter will pin the fact that you're live on every single person's homepage. Right. And so even if they don't watch it, they're aware that the thing is happening right now. Um, so that was just massive. Plus, you get to benefit if you use Restream. You get to benefit from people on YouTube discovering it. If you or go to Twitch. the YouTube audience grows. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, you're reaching more and more people. Exactly. So I will continue to do that. Um, and that is... I think that was probably the thing that went the best. Um, the launch to the email list was a little bumpy, but I yeah. think the the thing that went the best was all of my friends came and then a bunch of other people came and then a bunch of other people came and it was like, there's a critical mass watching me do the thing. Was there anything that you did to make that live stream more interactive? Like how, how do those... Is that people in comments? Yeah, people in chat. So um, the the tool that I was using, which I'm not affiliated with, but now I should be, for goodness <laughs> sakes, Restream, um, it aggregates the comments across YouTube, uh, Twitter, and I think I was actually live on LinkedIn as well um, and puts them all in a single chat. And so I could mm -hmm. see them. I have a little confidence monitor and I could see them and talk back to them. Um, and that's, you know, when I was writing the email, they were like, you're burying the lead. Like you got to right. move that part to the top. Like, oh, that's a good point. Um, so yeah, it was very interactive. Yeah, uh, that's awesome. I think that's something that I'm going to try. I'm not sure when I'm launching something. Well, the rebrand. When yeah. we rebrand from yeah, yeah, ConvertKit yeah. to the Kit. The whole thing's doing public. Like, you got to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do it live. Yeah. And so we'll. that'll be fascinating to pull together. Mm -hmm. You know, like there's a lot of complex things as we yes. move over in that. And October 1st is the date where we'll, we'll, we'll yes. actually cut over the app and all, we'll move a bunch of stuff beforehand. Yeah. But but, yeah, but at some point you're going to have to, you're going to have to turn a switch. That's like DNS point this way. And like, right. if you want to talk about nerve wracking edge of your seat, <laughs> put that live. People are going to be like, he's doing DNS <laughs> live. What a madman. Yeah. It's going to be great. Oh, uh, that's slightly terrifying. Yeah. There's this thing in content creation where, or, or in really business in general, of like making note of the thing that scares you. Mm -hmm. And that actually scares me. Mm -hmm. It and, should. <laughs> it absolutely and, should. And I think that is, it's going to make for great content. It's great content. Because you, like, if you think about the things that you can do in writing content or whatever else, where you're like, oh, and now I'm going to build the suspense a little bit mm -hmm. and then I'm going to give that payoff, mm -hmm. right? Or you could just do things that are inherently suspenseful. Yes, you could. You could you could do terrifying things live and people are going to be terrified, but they're going to love it. Have that popcorn kicking uh -huh, back. Exactly. All right, let's see what happens to these uh -huh. SEO results. <laughs> exactly. And you're going to get reports like, hey, I can't reach it in, you know, Arc browser. And you're going to be like, guys, they can't reach it in Arc browser. And it's going to, it's going to be great. I look forward oh, to it. Man. Yeah, that will be great. Well, if you can make sure to be there in the yeah, comments. Yeah, I absolutely will. <laughs> so that was a big win. Are there any mistakes that uh, you made that huge. others could learn from? Not huge, big. Um sending emails from a relatively cold domain. Mm, yeah. um, and this is something that I need your coaching on, which yeah. we'll move into at some point. I, I sent, you know, we had, I think by the time we launched, we had, you know, 5,000 people on the list. Mm -hmm. And I sent emails too quickly and Gmail put us in the penalty box. And so we didn't get, we didn't get blacklisted. We didn't get, you, you got know, deferred. We got deferred. Yeah. And it was <laughs> which like, is such a it's an odd term. So like, odd. So yeah. frustrating. Um, and one of the, like, after I, after this whole launch thing, I wrote a, a article on my blog that says, like, the title is, you're always doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's how I feel. Like, the cost of doing things is doing some things wrong. And we did that wrong. I should have either warmed up the domain better, but I'm hesitant to send emails because I'm a developer, or I mm. should have used AaronFrancis.com, which is literally 25 years old at this point and i've right. sent some emails from it but the domain itself has been in my possession for 25 years so you did a domain just course the course specific. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so i had people sign up at high performance sqlite.com and i sent all emails from high performance sqlite.com mm -hmm. and there are some technical fumbles there but i think there are also some strategic fumbles around i still i mean it's not like i lost the emails right. um but around what is our business brand and are mm -hmm. we doing discrete brands for every course that kind of stuff mm -hmm. okay that's interesting yeah so on the deliverability side you have to warm up mm -hmm. as as you've learned but for everyone else mm -hmm. watching you, you have to warm up that reputation an email sequence is the best way to do it mm -hmm. where people start you know high engagement they're getting those emails yep. they open gradually over time but it, it does take that time mm -hmm. and you want to start with the most engaged segments of your audience mm -hmm. And it's another reason, uh, we'll get into this in our coaching segment in a second, but 
um, it's another reason to consolidate your brands because some of these things that seem easy of like, Oh, another domain that's easy. It's nice. Each project has its own domain. God, it feels so clean. It, yeah. I can, I can tell the developer mm-hmm. in you. Mm-hmm. It's just like, Oh yes. Yep. <laughs> the scope is perfect. That's great. And it just, it creates all these unknown yep. downstream uh, effects. Cause you're like, well, did you set up Google postmaster tools for that domain? Mm-hmm. Probably not. Yep. <laughs> you know, yep. I bet you did later. <laughs> I did later. Yep. <laughs> Uh, oh, that's interesting. Were there any other mistakes that that came up in the launch that others could learn from? Yeah, I think our timeline was a little compressed. I mean, we turned this thing around quickly because mm-hmm. um, we, we had to. And so I think the timeline ended up being like three months. And that put a lot of three months from like we have nothing to I've read six books on SQLite. I've read the entire documentation of SQLite and I've recorded 70 videos and we've made a learning platform that timeline was a little bit compressed um and it caused me a lot of like stress Mm -hmm. and so i would in the future let it be a little bit of a slower burn um just because of the like mental and physical toll that it took on me recording all of that stuff Yeah. yeah Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so thank you for the deep dive into yeah. the course. I think that's a lot of things that first, 125000 in a launch is fantastic. You know, in 30 days, obviously revenue spikes. Mm-hmm. And so like the thing that I want to get into next is how we can scale this into a much more established business. Yes. So the last three years, you've grown a pretty substantial audience. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is the relationship you have with that audience, Mm -hmm. because even though there's a lot of people there, the numbers that you're putting up in course sales Mm -hmm. are significantly higher, you know, and we're talking at a price point that's not crazy high. Yeah. You know, you're not selling $3,000, $5,000 at a time. And so to get that revenue per subscriber, you have to have a really high conversion rate between Mm -hmm. your offer and, you know, in the list. Mm -hmm. And so how do you think about building like a high trust relationship Mm. with your audience. Yeah, that is well said because I do feel like the relationship I have, and I even hesitate to call it an audience because I Mm -hmm. feel so connected to so many of them. Like um, there are, you know, within within an audience, there are concentric circles. And at the very middle, it's like, they're they're my friends. Like they're my internet friends. And so I do feel like I have... um, I think through very careful thought, been able to put together an audience that really trusts me. And mm-hmm. I have thought about this a lot because what I have seen, and there, I feel like there have been phases and primarily where I spend most of my um, audience or social time is on Twitter. May it rest in peace. So <laughs> I, I spend a lot of time on Twitter and what I have seen is these waves come through, right? So there was the, um, there was the thread wave. Mm-hmm. Then there was and continues to be the meme wave where everything is a meme. And as I have seen these things come through, um, I have noticed that like looking back on the thread wave now, a lot of those people that grew massive followings very quickly on um, doing these super long form threads no longer have any reach whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So you look back at somebody who grew fantastically during the pandemic and they're getting, you know, they've got 80 to 100,000 followers and they're getting 100 to 1,000 views on their tweets. Right. And I'm looking at that and I'm like, this is not necessarily the truth, but this is indicative of some truth. And I think the underlying truth is they have a very tenuous connection with their audience. So they did one really good thread and a lot of people followed them for that. And then later on, it was like, I don't know this person. I'm not going to engage with this person. I have no connection with this person. And so my goal, my entire goal all along has been, how can I um, grow an audience of people who actually know me? As Mm -hmm. As much as someone can know someone else from afar, how can I grow an audience of people that know me? And my strategies there have just really frankly been to to basically share everything that I'm working on and do it in a very, um, like a non preachy way. Cause I think another trap that beginners or or people who are trying to grow an audience fall into is they start talking like Sahil Bloom. Right. And it's like, like like they're an expert in some way positioned that way. yeah. Yeah. And like, the hard part is maybe they are an expert, but nobody else knows it yet. And when you start talking in these aphorisms and pithy statements, it's like, who are you preaching at? Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to maintain a certain level of like authenticity and I'm figuring this out as I go. And sometimes I do have thoughts that are very like, 
deeply rooted in expertise, but I don't ever want to be preachy. And so trying to find that balance of being a real human being while also trying to gather like-minded people around me, mm -hmm. it's kind of, it's kind of difficult, which is why my growth has been a lot slower than some people, but I, and this is maybe a cope. I think it's a lot more dense, right? right? So I don't have a large diffuse audience. I have a pretty good size, dense audience that, that trusts me. You brought up the threads and the memes. One thing, like as we're in our meme phase right mm -hmm. now on, on X, it's interesting. I've heard of quite a few people actually talk about how like as they've grown their audience further through memes or these, mm -hmm. you know, fairly cheap interactions mm -hmm. that the audience just doesn't stick around. Yes. And so I think about that with, well, like if we contrast threads and memes, mm -hmm. they're both in their phases. We're both very good at, at top of funnel awareness. Yeah. And so I was thinking about where I ended up because I wrote a lot of threads mm -hmm. and, you know, built the, my Twitter following to, I think it's 120, 130,000. Mm -hmm. And that worked really, really well. But I think the twist on it is that I really tried to write threads that only I could write. Yes. And Not top 10 chat GPT extensions. Oh, man. Yes. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Or the, yeah. Your like, reaction is what I'm talking about. Because <laughs> oh, right now, well, like what I'm seeing right now is uh, people are saying like, the Olympics are over. Here's the 10 moments. <gasps> Here's think, the <laughs> image of the guy shooting 10 times. I'm like, yes, I've seen it. <laughs> I've seen it. Yeah. And so it's thinking about what is the thing that brings your experience mm -hmm. into it? So like, this is from my experience, how to build a great company mm -hmm. culture in a remote team. This is, yep. you know, the story of how we did direct sales to grow ConvertKit. Mm -hmm. And that, especially in, in the world of AI, I think is so important because content creation is, is cheap and easy. Mm -hmm. You know, like before for threads, someone's like, what Wikipedia article can I copy and paste? Yes. And go Wikipedia, Google images, boom, 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 yes. thread. 100,000 views, we're done. Mm -hmm. Anyone can do that. Mm -hmm. And so it's really like, how do you bring in the life experience and the stories? Mm -hmm. It's like for anyone who's written a book, if you're writing from a position of expertise, it's really hard to trust that expertise until I know, like when was the painful moment mm -hmm. in your life when you internalized that lesson? Yep. Like what was the mistake that you made? For me, like the time that I learned to build an email list, was when I had that article go viral on Hacker News. I thought that I'd absolutely made it. Mm -hmm. And if you, you know, hid that moment in the Google Analytics graph, you would never know mm -hmm. that anything had happened because I didn't capture that attention anyway. It and all it, went away. It all went away. <laughs> and so, you know, people have told me like, oh, I trusted you on the advice of build an email list mm -hmm. after that because I know the painful moment when like yep. you gave up what would have been thousands of email subscribers mm -hmm. because of that mistake that you made. Other places where you've told stories or brought in like that authentic side of yourself that has added to that connection? Um, yeah. So I have done a few conference talks. So mm -hmm. the world in which I live is primary, primarily development. So I've been to a few you know, development conferences and given yep. what would be considered soft talks because mm -hmm. they call you know technical talks hard talks and anything <laughs> that's not technical is a soft talk. So I gave a few soft talks. Um, yeah. One of them was at uh, a conference called Laracon, which is a mm -hmm. Laravel conference. And I was the last speaker. <laughs> And I gave uh, I gave my absolute best talk that I could give, and it was about publishing your work and how um, basically you can increase the amount of luck that comes your way if you just put your stuff out there. And it was like an, it was um, an impassioned plea to the audience to put their stuff out there. And woven into that were stories of when I watched a bunch of other people get stuff that I wanted and I was bitter. And I was like, why is this all happening to them and not me? I'm right. smart. And the answer was because they're, they're putting their stuff out there mm -hmm. and I'm sitting at home bitter and nobody knows who I am for, through, through no fault of their own. It's my fault. And so that was like, that was the inciting incident maybe in 2020 or yeah, I think it was 2020 when I realized like, I've got two options here. I could watch other people um, make friends, go to conferences, speak at conferences, get jobs, make money. I could watch that and be bitter, or I could just start putting my work out there and mm -hmm. see what happens. And the first option is really safe because you, it requires nothing of you. You just get to sit at home and be mad. And no one will ever criticize you for no it. No one will ever criticize yeah. you for it. The second option is terribly scary because you're exposing yourself to criticism. Mm -hmm. Um, and that single story has kind of been the through line through all of this, which is like, 
my coming to terms with um, exposing myself to criticism and mm -hmm. being okay being out there in the void all by myself, which is what it feels like it sometimes. Does. When you put something heartfelt out and you're like, I'm you know, bearing a part of my soul here, like what are the people on the internet going to think? And then you realize, oh man, I don't care what the people on the internet are going to think. This is all going to be over so soon. I don't want to look back and think, I um, wish I had cared less what, you know, <laughs> butt crack 72 on Twitter thought. Like, I don't care. I need to put this work into the world. And so that was kind of like my painful turning point that has mm. been repurposed into, guys, do not be like I was. Do it this way. And it has resonated pretty well. What's fascinating to me is you and I have such similar uh, creator arcs. Mm -hmm. Basically, you know, I got my start in design and development. And then the first content that I made was, you know, a lot of technical content mm -hmm. about, about design. And the person that made me switch the way that I was thinking was Chris Coyer, who mm. uh, wrote CSSTricks.com. Mm -hmm. Not because I was like, Chris is amazing. Let me uh, copy him. But I remember when he started the website and I watched him launch it and I had this weird perception about expertise. Like he wrote an article yes. and I read that and I was like, yep, who's he to think he's an expert? Like, I know how to do that. Mm -hmm. And then he published something else. I'm like, I know how to do that too. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was like, I'm better at CSS than Chris Coyer. That's option one <laughs> is to sit at home and say, I'm better than Chris Coyer. Yes. yes. And I, I fully lived in option yep. one. And then it did get to the point after a while where he would publish an article and I'd be like, well, that's better explained mm. than I would explain. It. I knew that, but it's mm -hmm. better to explain than I would explain it. So let me, when a coworker asks, Hey, how do I do this thing? Mm -hmm. I don't know. We're probably troubleshooting internet explorer six Classic. CSS bugs. And I'd be like, Oh, here, read this article. And then I'll help you with mm -hmm. it. And so it went from like, I'm better than this to like, Oh, this is useful. And then there was a point where I was like, Oh, I, I learned something. Mm -hmm. And thinking back, I'm like, that's such an arrogant, place to be it is <laughs> it is an arrogant cynical place to be and i can say that because i was there yeah. yes and so but the the turning point when i realized because i was like we're the same mm -hmm. and we're the same is actually generous what i th thought was i'm better mm -hmm. and revisionist history there yeah <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> and so when chris came out with a kickstarter campaign to say i want to uh raise three thousand five hundred dollars in kickstarter what a, so, what a quaint time. <laughs> <laughs> so that I can take a month off of client work mm -hmm. and all of that and focus on redesigning CSS tricks and make this like a great, a really great site for the community. Mm -hmm. If you back it, I will uh, record behind the scenes. I'll record some training material, all that. And that's what you'll get for backing it. And a big thank you. And I was like, 3,500 bucks. Like, I, I think you could probably hit that. We'll see. And it was something like eighty-seven thousand ah, dollars. Okay, there we go. Yep, that, <laughs> that, that makes hit, sense. You know, forty-five days later, yep. and it just blew my mind because here I was thinking like I know more CSS. Mm -hmm. Now I feel like well maybe he, I'm like starting to admit maybe he knows more than I do, but I realized like we are not the same mm -hmm. at all. He had the ability to go in front of an audience and say, <laughs> "Here's the thing that I want to do. Mm -hmm. Will you support me in it?" And uh, you know thousands a thousand people or more are like yes absolutely and i had none of that mm -hmm. and so that's when it really hit me that you know it beyond this baseline of expertise like it's not that people teach because they're experts it's we perceive them as Correct. experts because they teach yes and i had that whole equation backwards mm -hmm. and so it's fascinating as you like you went through the mm -hmm. exact same thing i sat and watched people tweet stuff and i was like yeah come on i know that right. i'm so smart and then it really dawned on me that doing the work and sharing the work are discrete mm -hmm. tasks. And you and I both went through the phase of like, oh, I could do that. But then the there was an entire vector that was missing, which was sharing the work. Right. And so you and I were both doing the work and very, you know, very good at it, frankly. But you and I doing work, we were good at it. But then these other people were doing work of equal quality or maybe less, mm -hmm. but they were talking about it. And that was the realization that I had, that which, which was like, it's not enough, depending on your goal, it's not enough to do the work. You have to tell people as mm -hmm. well. And so that, that two-pronged doing things and telling people is where I, that was the big turning point in, in my life. 
so the three different mantras that I really internalized and then adding a fourth later, um, but it started with teach everything, you know, mm -hmm. of just saying like, it's okay that I'm not an expert, but I, I just learned this thing mm -hmm. and I'm not teaching it to the cynical person, you know, the me, nitpicker, yeah. yeah, the nitpicker who was me, mm -hmm. you know, six mm -hmm. months ago, I'm teaching it to the person who's one step behind me, mm -hmm. who like just learned how to install rails on their mm -hmm. console and get, get that going. And they're like, I don't know what to do next. And the expert is like, just do this. Mm -hmm. And they're like, I, you skipped like 12 steps because it's intuitive to you. And yep. I didn't get it. The second thing is work in public. I was doing all of the work and I just wasn't sharing it. Mm -hmm. And so I remember doing math homework, you know, in probably early high school. And it was still easy enough in algebra or whatever, mm -hmm. where I could just look at the problem and be like, that's the answer. Mm -hmm. And I was homeschooled. And so my mom, as my teacher, was like, you have to show your work. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, but the answer is correct. Mm -hmm. And she's like, I know the answer is correct, but at some point it won't be. And you have to demonstrate that you actually know how to do it. Mm -hmm. And it's the the same thing of like the expertise. The demonstrated expertise comes from showing your work, mm -hmm. not the polished end result. Yep. Unfortunately, the the build in public, uh, like it's mantra, sort of a meme now. It is. It's become very thin. It's mm -hmm. become very shallow. When in public, yes. Is what it's I think that is exactly right. Or ask silly questions in public, like, um, you know, Mac or PC. What do you use to develop? And you're like, guys, this isn't anything. <laughs> like, what we're what we're not what we're not after is, um, like vapid engagement bait mm -hmm. when when building in public the way that i view it as anything that i'm doing that while in the midst of my work which i think is pretty important while actually working mm -hmm. i see something that is either interesting or i learned that right. i should have known already that's a great one like if you can prove hey i'm an expert in some area and i just discovered this really simple thing that i should have known do you guys know about this um that i find is better fodder for building in public than sitting down on a monday and trying to come up with 14 tweets to schedule about building in public for the rest of the week i think that is a huge mistake i think the real win is do the work mm -hmm. and then from that extract interesting things that you come across in the course of working and share that with the world and then Importantly, I think once you share it, your responsibility is done. You've been absolved of your of your duty once you share it. If it goes great, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. If it goes poorly, that's okay. Your responsibility is to do the work and to put it out there. And then if it resonates, maybe you learn something about what resonates with the audience. If it falls flat, that's fine. Move on. You've got a yeah. bunch more where that came from. And I think I, I see a lot of people... Um, putting a lot of pressure on their content to do a certain thing and not necessarily focusing on the habit of putting it out there. Right. So they do something and it fails and they're like, building public is dead. And you're like, no, this is the game, man. Just keep going. And so I think that is an unfortunate um, skewing of what I think is a good tactic, which is building public. It is skewed a little bit cheap and easy. Yeah, that makes sense. I think it's around the journey that you're going on. Mm -hmm. There's a, a creator who I followed years ago named Colisteed, who uh, he built the in whole Envato network. And, oh, wow. And yeah. they, you know, Net to, tuts and all of those. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, like hundreds of millions, maybe a billion dollar valuation uh -huh. or more. And he said the best way to be interesting online is to do interesting things offline. Yes. And 100%. I think about that of like, Anytime someone says, hey, I want to get into content creation, I'm like, okay, cool. What journey are you going on? Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, I'm going to do like the build in public thing. And it's like, that's yes. not a goal. About what? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so it's thinking about what's that journey that you're going on and then tell the story of it. Mm -hmm. Like for ConvertKit, when I said, I'm going to build a SaaS app mm -hmm. to 5000 a month in recurring mm -hmm. revenue in six months, and live blog the whole thing. Mm -hmm. All these people came around me, you know. I, me included. <laughs> yeah. I remember that, yeah. <laughs> so I think of like Heaton Shaw and Amy mm -hmm. Hoy and all these other others who said, like, let me help you. Mm -hmm. They'd get on calls and strategize. Like Amy Hoy and I wrote a whole bunch of copy mm -hmm. together because she's like, I see that you're going somewhere and I'd like to help you, mm -hmm. to help you get there. Instead of what I think most people who want to be creators are doing is they're just creating content for the sake of creating content. Which is where than, you get the Wikipedia threads. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And then you're chasing those views. Mm -hmm. One other thing that you've done a lot of that I, I know from following you on X is 
you, you incorporate a lot of video. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that intimidates a lot of creators. Yeah. So how do you think about bringing video into the equation, especially if you're, you know, more heavy on LinkedIn or X or, right. or a newsletter and then how that plays into the relationship with the audience? Yeah, it's very interesting. And I think, um, it's becoming more interesting with the proliferation of AI slop in, in written form, right? So yep. anybody can just throw together written content very easily, not to say that it's good. Um, so I think, you know, going back to Chris Coyer, you, um, you ascribed to him or you said that he is the expert because he's teaching, right? Mm -hmm. So these people in public get these certain accolades deserved or not. As a podcaster, I'm sure you get people saying, oh, Nathan's got a podcast. You're like, oh, I'm, yeah. oh, I listen to your podcast all the time. And it's like, I'm just sitting down and talking with friends. <laughs> yeah, it's like exactly. behind the scenes, that's yeah, kind of normal. But this, um, the outward uh, presentation of it, everybody's like, oh man, he's got a website and he's got mm -hmm. a blog. And so I think there are un, maybe not unfair, but skewed um, weights put on certain types of content, right? So at the bottom of the pyramid, most people do nothing. It's just the biggest, hugest part of the pyramid is people yeah. just consuming. No moral judgments. That is reality. Still 99% of the population. Yes, easily. And that's fine. If you lead a quiet life and work with your hands and don't spend all your time on the computer, that sounds More power awesome. to you. Yeah. yeah. Congrats to you. <laughs> um, but for the rest of us sickos, um, moving up from there, you have like text content, like short form text content, very easy to tweet. Mm -hmm. Long form text content, writing blogs, a little bit harder. It takes a little bit more thought, less so than it used to, but a little bit more thought. And then you move up to like video, live coding, speaking at conferences. And there are fewer and fewer people um, up there on the pyramid. This is not mm -hmm. a value pyramid. This is just a population pyramid. There right. are fewer people up there. So the unfair or um, skewed accolades accrue to you more because you're not competing with very many people. Right. So you get to the top and you're doing video and where there are, to just use a round number, a hundred bloggers, there are three people making videos, four mm -hmm. people making videos, right? And so the perceived value of video, I think, goes way up because there are fewer people doing it, but also it's just a lot harder to do. Like it is a lot harder, both technically and emotionally, to make video than it is to write blog posts. And I've done both, and I find that to continue to be true, to turn on the video and expose my face to the world and be like, this is actually me. There's no hiding behind Grammarly or anything else. Mm -hmm. It's hard, um, but I don't think it is without, it, it is not a cost without benefit. I think the benefit is people really, really connect um, to other human beings. I feel, feel like that's pretty well understood. And it's easier to connect with another human being on audio or video over text. And so audio podcasts, great way to start like, not a good way to grow an audience, but a great way right. to deepen an audience. And then video YouTube is just a distribution juggernaut unto itself that cannot be rivaled. And mm -hmm. so being able to put video onto YouTube and then hopefully YouTube says, very good, we will reward you. Like that's what you're after. It's just, un it's unbeatable. Even with, with blogging and email, like you kind of have to bring the people to you. Mm -hmm. Podcasts, boy, do you have to bring the people to you. If you can put video on um, YouTube, they will bring the people to you. And now that um, Twitter or X has decayed into basically TikTok, they're optimizing for video as well. Right. And LinkedIn is like, hey, make go live on LinkedIn. Why? To whom? But like if the platforms are rewarding it, maybe it's a good thing to think about. Yeah. How do you think about the balance between, you know, the influencer world mm. and the creator world and your own Oof. identity and how you spend your time? I think about it a lot. So that's uh, that's how much I think about it. How do I think about it? Um, I have a sort of visceral reaction, um, and I think it's included in the word visceral, that it's a bad reaction to mm -hmm. the word influencer. Um, I don't... Aaron Francis influencer. Yeah, don't that, love the, that's don't not, love that's the sound of that. Please don't, yeah, <laughs> please don't make that the title we'll of this that. one. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't begrudge people who identify as influencers. I make mo no moral judgments about it. I don't mm -hmm. want to be an influencer. I don't mind having influence. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't mind that at all. I want to influence people for what I think are pure right and good reasons. However, 
Um, in my opinion, an influencer is typically someone who has a lot of opinions. Yeah. That is typically um, what an influencer is or does. They have opinions on everything that is happening in, in the zeitgeist. I, I, I simply don't. What I want to be known for is creating really good work and doing things um, – doing things that are durable and last a long time and are of value. Mm -hmm. And so if I had to give myself a moniker, I would say that I'm a creator. I mean, before that, I would, you know, maybe even at a lower level, I would say I'm a small business owner. <laughs> like I'm not a startup guy. I'm just yeah. not. Somebody recently asked me, oh, so you like run a startup? And I'm like, well, we run a small business. Yeah. Like it's not a startup. And so the the idea of being an influencer and the value of um the value that is ascribed to me is because I can I don't even know what an influencer is in in our world. Like an influencer in the broad world is someone who's very pretty <laughs> and posts a lot on Instagram, right? Right. And you know, the Kardashians have turned that into an unbelievable business empire. And so like you can absolutely pull it off, but I want to focus primarily on the work and hopefully the work reflects well upon me. And if people follow me for that reason, I'm super happy. Um, but I don't want to have opinions on what open AI is doing because I don't know. Right. Yeah. And that, that pundit aspect of it. Pundit. Yes. Yeah. We had a, um, a mutual friend of ours was, was asking like a thing come out this a couple of years ago and they're like, Nathan, what's your opinion on this? Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't have an opinion. Yes. I just, I just make stuff. Yes, exactly. And, and I'm here to share my lessons and, and, you know, that I've learned from the journey mm -hmm. of making things. And that's really the different approach. Instead of this thing coming out and you're like, oh, I have to have an opinion. The people this. have to know what I have to think about it. Yeah. I'm like, I don't, and I get that often. The most that I get that in my line of work is, hey, can you do a comparison of this technology and this technology? Mm. And I'm like, I can't, I'm sorry. I don't have enough expertise in one or both um, to give a fair comparison, and I'm not going to do something just because it's good content. So all the content that I produce has to spring from some well of expertise, interest, or curiosity. I don't have to be an expert about everything, but I have to like be curious about it. And when people come along and are like, hey, can you compare Next.js to Laravel? I'm like, no, sorry. What else do you have? Because I can't do that. And I don't yeah. want to do that. And I see a lot of people um, doing these like these shallow level comparisons of all these technologies. And I'm like, I don't know that you use all of those. And mm -hmm. so this isn't, this isn't really valuable at all. Right. So I try to stay away from that. Just give us a little bit. Where should people go to follow you if they want to learn more about the journey? See what it looks like to, mm -hmm. to authentically build in public yeah. as you do. Uh, you can find every link at AaronFrancis.com. But where I primarily spend my time is on Twitter X at Aaron D. Francis. So that's where I hang out the most. Sounds good. Okay, so that's it for this episode. But what we're going to do is we're going to get up on the whiteboard and we're going to talk about what it takes to turn a $125,000 course launch into a sustainable business for two people where we can build this really into you know the small empire that they want. If you enjoyed this episode, go to the YouTube channel, just search Billion Dollar Creator and go ahead and subscribe. Make sure to like the video and uh, drop a comment. I'd love to hear what some of your favorite parts of the video were and also who else we should have on the show. 